At first, I was at the state security ministry's basement, and those were the most difficult, horrible conditions. Then it got a little better. The first nice period was when I was in a little cell. There were some difficulties, but at least you could live there. Later, I was relocated to a place that was formerly used as death row in Soviet times. These days, they hold people with life sentences or those they want to torture in there. Those were very difficult conditions because the cells were extremely small and you could barely move inside them. You could either sit or lay down. There is a hole in the floor right next to you, which they call a toilet. It was very tough. The state security ministry is curated by the FSB. It's practically an open secret. Everyone knows about it. Even the local DPR administration cannot influence the state security ministry because the state security ministry comes to the FSB directly, and you can feel it. Any office you go in, you'll find portraits of Stalin, Putin, and then Zaharchenko. The moods are changing, of course. I had an opportunity to find this out from the ordinary prisoners who were detained for criminal cases and then sent onward to prison colonies. Just recently, they were on the outside. They have a feeling of futility. Everyone says that the region is not viable. Factories stop working. The majority of the mines don't operate anymore. People look for easy money. Everything that could have been stolen has already been stolen. And all the metal parts in the city have been looted. So what's next? How do we live? Those who have a stable job find their, their ways to survive. There are whole regions where people had industrial jobs. They worked in the factories, mines, and other establishments. So what is to be done? to leave, mostly to Russia. If they have relatives, they push them to move to Russia or to Ukraine. But of course, this is done with more caution. And then there are rumors that the people from Donetsk are not wanted in Ukraine, that if they go back, they will be pariahs there. They really believe this and pass these stories on to each other. These cases really do exist, but all people are different. Some are hot-tempered, we should understand that. But people see what they want to see. You can call it a show that's been acted out many times, when they point a gun at you and say they're going to play Russian roulette and then spin the cylinder. Or when they just fire at you. There are many such cases. Some were tortured with electricity. That, of course, was horrible. The torturers knew that they just needed to extract a confession. Primitive and unprofessional. They have a task, and this task is very simple. To force charges upon people, extract a confession, and then they pass the case on to the investigator, and then on to the court, and so on. One thing is absolutely clear. We should never, and under no circumstances, give up our territories. It would be a terrible precedent. No way. It's our land, and that's clear-cut. It's not a subject for discussion, no matter what anyone wants or says. And it's not just a territory. It's also the people, our residents with Ukrainian passports, and their mindsets and opinions. Yes, they've been subject to the ideological propaganda of the so-called Russian world. We need to fight for these people, too. They are human beings. I've been told that part of the nation supports the resolution of the conflict by force, and another part wants dialogue, a peaceful resolution. As always, the truth is somewhere in the middle. We need both kinds of efforts. We need to strengthen the Ukrainian army to make it more powerful. It needs to be defensive in its nature. We don't want to attack, but it still requires us a lot of work. On the other hand, we need to use force. We need to stand by our borders and restore them. The other thing we need is for the powerful and healthy society to finally mature. As I said, they have different stances, but they should have one goal, the sovereignty and unity of Ukraine. We know that for Ukraine to develop and flourish, we need a civil society. The other thing is that I think our society lacks maturity, hence why there are, are polar tendencies. Why is there a need for a civil society in this case? to establish a connection with the people on the other side of the demarcation line. Many retain family and friendship ties with them. We just need to meet these people, to talk with them, to calmly explain our position. I always tell my students that in order to not get disappointed in people, we need to not make idols. I will not get disappointed in anyone simply because I love people the way they are. I love my country the way it is. 
Yes, Ukraine is corruption, and yes, there are many other problems, but we chose the right direction to move in, to the global society. In spiritual practices, there is this idea that the road is also the destination. What is enlightenment? Enlightenment is a process. It's when you walk in the tunnel, and as you walk, you see more and more light. We're still walking in this tunnel, but we're walking in the direction of the light, and demanding for all of the light to come at once is too big a demand. But should we still demand it? Yes, we should. Now, well, for instance, um, we're speaking about the uh, building of democracy, mm -hmm. and uh, yet uh, there is a concept that today mm -hmm. a lot of governments, a lot of people who come to power, uh, they have... They, they proclaim that they have democratic views, mm -hmm. they respect elections, mm -hmm. they have parties, but in the end, it's more or less a facade of democracy. Mm -hmm. In the end, everybody already, already know how to rig the elections, mm -hmm. how to not let the opponents to the media, mm -hmm. uh, and in the end, have just the party who doesn't really consult uh, the population, uh, and this, ref this idea of the freedom, freedom of speech, and all the reforms are often kind of considered as something annoying, enforced by the West, which we have to do to cooperate with the Western allies. Mm -hmm. To what extent you see these concerns, and to what extent it's applicable to Ukraine? And what could be done with that? So that's a definite problem. There's a rise of populism, uh, populist nationalists in many parts of Eastern Europe, and you know you see signs of this in Western Europe and even in the United States right now. Uh, a democracy is a really complex thing, a liberal democracy, because it needs a, a clean, impartial state uh, to deliver services and protect the population. It needs a rule of law, which limits the power of the state and it needs democratic elections accountability to make sure the state responds to the interests of the whole people. And what's happening is these populists are using their democratic legitimacy to undermine the other two parts. So they corrupt the state, you know, they make the state their own piggy bank, you know, for their own business interests. They uh, get in bed with businessmen, oligarchs that, you know, want to use state power to protect their businesses and vice versa. Uh, and they really hate the rule of law, because the rule of law prevents them from doing what they want. It shields them from accountability. And so this is the pattern you're seeing in Hungary and Poland and Turkey, uh, and I think even in some respects in the United States, uh, where these populist leaders are using their popular mandate to weaken the other uh, institutions of liberal democracy. Uh, but if we also um, speak about um, Ukraine, mm -hmm. let's say, <clears throat> Uh, so, um, in, in, in that uh, in, in, in that regard, um, uh, to, to, I'm asking about this kind of play with the West. Mm -hmm. When the people say that, okay, uh, we will follow the reforms, we'll do that, but mm -hmm. in fact, the state building is more important, especially when we're living in a turbulent times. Mm -hmm. For instance, in case of Ukraine, we definitely have a Russian aggression. Mm -hmm. So, uh, we can make some compromises. Mm -hmm. uh, Maybe temporary, mm -hmm. but unless we have a war, we have we can do compromises on freedoms, on some other things, and that will be sorted out later. Mm -hmm. What do you would say to that extent? How these kind of ideas of freedom and the state building mm -hmm. in a very a volatile environment mm -hmm. works together? Well, you know, the state building has good aspects and bad aspects. Its bad aspects is when the government uses war as an excuse to clamp down on criticism, on journalists, on opposition groups that. May, you know, object to things that it's doing. Uh, on the other hand, you know, wars are very serious in terms of creating national identity and a certain sense of unity. So, uh, in Ukraine, I, I see both of those things going on. Uh, I do see the war, you know, being used uh, to some extent by the government as an excuse for not addressing certain kinds of reforms that are, are necessary. Because really, the state needs to be not just strong in a repressive sense; it needs to be strong in the sense of being, you know, a clean institution that can actually respond to public interests rather than the private interests of, you know, oligarchs or well-connected people. Ukraine, after the revolution, we had a lot of advisors coming, for instance, from Eastern Europe who looking to the example of the reforms of the 19s in Poland, in Czech Republic, in mm -hmm. Slovakia. Uh, yet, that was 
right after communist time. There was not the uh, reforms in the oligarchic mm -hmm. system, mm -hmm. uh, which you know sometimes require privatization and other things. In Ukraine, everything already is owned mm -hmm. uh, by somebody. Mm -hmm. And you know, how do you see the difference? How do you see to what extent that? kind of just, just usual things shouldn't be copy-pasted. Well, I think that's right, that the way that privatization was done in the 1990s allowed oligarchs to basically capture very large parts of the economy, and they still are dominant in Ukraine. Uh, that didn't happen in the Czech Republic and Poland and Hungary, uh, although now in Hungary you're kind of getting the emergence of new oligarchs because of, you know, Orban's policy. But in Ukraine, uh, it's a legacy. I think the only way that you can deal with it is by introducing more competition. You know, there needs to be more small and medium-sized businesses growing up that are not part of this oligarchic system. There need to be more multinationals uh, investing in Ukraine. Uh, that's the only way I think you chip away at that domination of the economy by, by this oligarchic structure. And we do have a president who is one of the richest men in the country, which... Actually, he has his business and he runs, so, uh, and it doesn't look like there is any choice that he would give uh, away his, uh, what he owns or he would run. So still, it's so interconnected. Mm -hmm. And like, is it the rule that the people with that amount of money just don't go to politics? Well, it's going to be hard to impose that kind of rule, yeah. you know, retroactively. So I think it, it's a norm that really has to evolve over time. I mean, you need to elect a different, you know, type of politician, I think, down the road um, so that that you know, that distinction is uh, is observed. As I'm saying, unfortunately, this seems to be a trend in a lot of countries where people with money use their money to get political power and people with political power use it to protect their money. Uh, and that, uh, you know, is something in law that, that needs to be addressed because that's that's not a good development. You know, I think you for, for many years you are answering on what was meant by the term the end of history and you're doing that, I think, for numerous interviews for many, many years. Uh, but if we speak about in, uh, in the end, uh, the ideas of liberal democracy, which have probably moral superiority mm -hmm. globally still, do you really still think it's there? And uh, to what extent you think that this uh, Russian idea of postmodernism, mm -hmm. of this nihilism, where uh, that you know, that people become, started to believe that it's, it's indeed these democratic ideas, it's, it's a bit of a hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. Because uh, everybody's corrupt, even the democratic governments are corrupt. Uh, so it, it comes to the place. So, so to what extent do you think this nihilism is really uh, thriving? You know, I don't think that you can build a society around nihilism, like you say. Uh, I think that if the Russian government tries to project this idea that everything is corrupt, it's going to come back to haunt them because people are going to stop believing in you know, their own institutions. So I really don't think that you can build a successful society around these very cynical uh, ideas that simply want to weaken everybody else. Uh, eventually that's going to come back uh, to haunt you. There is no Russian idea right now. I mean, what does Russia represent other than, you know, the opportunity for tremendous political corruption? It's not like communism. You know, communism, for all of its evils, was actually an ideal of a kind of society that was attractive to people in other places, and I just don't see that in the Russian idea right now. Uh, but it's attractive in other places. The well, no, no, the idea of nihilism is not attractive. What, what the Russians are doing is exacerbating existing polarizations and divisions and uncertainties within other countries. That's different from projecting an actual idea. That's simply, you know, trying to widen gaps that already exist. But that's not an idea around which you can build a successful society. So if you would single out some couple of maybe, you know, the priority at this stage while talking to different people, while looking at Ukraine mm -hmm. in terms of the change which is necessary. Well, I think most people would put judicial reform at the top of the list. You know, there really needs to be strong structures that are very independent of the political forces in the country that can really hold officials accountable. Uh, I think, you know, in, in the economy there really needs to be a land reform uh, because there's a lot of hidden assets that are locked up and unavailable, you know, that uh, could spark a lot of growth in this country. Uh, I think those would be two 
things that would be at the top of my list. Well, I think Ukraine is very symbolically important to the entire region because it's a country that's trying to break away from its Soviet and Russian past. It wants to orient itself towards Europe. It has a right to do that. Uh, I think that uh, Putin understands that this is what's at stake, and that's why he wants to stop it from happening. So I think that Ukraine has a significance that goes way beyond Ukraine. And if it succeeds, uh, other countries will be take heart from that. And if it fails, uh, they're going to get discouraged. So I think that's, that's why Ukraine is a very that's why country right now. You had many meetings with Ukrainian officials and representatives of the NGOs and civil society. Um, so what are your impressions uh, that you had after these meetings about the role of women and the position of women, uh, both in military and in also in, in conflict, as it is very actual for Ukraine? I've been incredibly impressed by uh, everyone I've met, but primarily about the women. Uh, Ukraine has a very, very active, very strong and quite impressive women's civil society. And uh, we have had the opportunity to meet many women uh, across the spectrum here in Ukraine and to listen to their voices about what's important to them in, in the context of Ukraine, but in the context of security and what does security mean to them. And uh, we're listening. We're here on a listening mode. We uh, intend, obviously, to come back, but at, in, in at the present time, hearing women's voices and what they understand about the essential elements of security and what does a safe society mean for them is very important. But having a legislative framework and making sure, especially in defense, that there's plenty of women who are represented in the national forces, that we have women's voices included in the defense industry, and that we have more women at a leadership level, which is very important, uh, as you'll know, in defense and security. How can NATO cooperate and maybe support the Ukrainian military also in this context of promoting the agenda of gender equality and women's security? Part of that action plan is to look at uh, two things. One, to increase numbers of women in defense forces, and the other is to make sure that all military doctrine reflects a gender perspective. You need to have women at general level. There needs to be women who are across the board included in, in defence. Um, and this is in, in line with the international agreements. This is in line with the National Action Plan. And so what we would look to do is to help support Ukraine, uh, help support understand what indicators are needed and support civil society so that their voices are included in the defence uh, area too. You have a vast experience working in conflict and post-conflict zones such as Kosovo, for example. So, from your experience, what can Ukraine now in the situation of conflict that is still ongoing in, in Donbass uh, do to protect women and kids who are there in the area of the conflict? Conflict affects women very differently to men, and that is the premise of women, peace and security, that conflict is not the same for everybody and women are disproportionately impacted. Quite often we have in conflict issues of conflict-related sexual violence, uh, IDPs, refugees, uh, children, unaccompanied minors. Um, we see these in all conflicts and, and it's how we address them and make sure that we are responding adequately politically as well as uh, operationally to, to those issues. Protecting women means that we also have to hear women and we have to hear what they have to tell us. And sometimes we seem to uh, provide legislative process without actually including women's voices. Women are the best indicators of their own protection. So women will suffer trauma of war uh, very differently to men. So having women, for example, who are combatants or women reintegrating back into their communities, do we know what the challenges they're going to have? Do we know medically how women are... Uh, the different impact that the conflict will have on them? And then you have... Uh, when you have men who are... Uh, who have trauma of war. Uh, what about their wives and their children? How do we make sure we have programs that are going to take into account they also suffer? There were reported cases of sexual violence in the conflict zone in Ukraine, and, uh, and these cases allegedly were um, made by both parties of the conflict. But um, in most of these cases, the investigation didn't go through, also because there is um, some stigma and opposition and 
this is like a taboo topic in the society. So how can we overcome this? Because this is a very important issue, but it isn't even talked about. It is, and it needs to be, because it is, it's present in every conflict. There used to be an assumption that uh, sexual violence was an automatic output of war, that women's bodies were just part of the booty of war, that, they, that it was um, an unfortunate but recognised consequence. We now know that's not true. We know since 2008 that with the adoption of resolutions, United Nations County Re uh, Security Council resolutions on conflict-related sexual violence, that it is not an automatic consequence of war and that it will not be accepted by the international community. Sexual violence or any kind of violation against women is against international human rights law. Early July, uh, we are talking about the four years since the Ukrainian towns in the Donbas, Slavyansk and Kramatorsk had been freed by the Ukrainian army. Uh, since then, uh, we believe a lot had been rebuilt, but is it really the case? Are the people happy with what they have and what is the political situation there? Besides, 2018 uh, and 2019 would be a big election years for the Ukrainian public. We're speaking about both presidential and parliamentary elections. And obviously the war is a very, very important factor. But uh, what impact it has already in, in the Donbas uh, near the front line, we are happy here to have Andriy Romanenko, who is the coordinator of the Center of the Civic Control D. Kramatorsk, ex Kramatorsk. Uh, so, Andrei, it's been four years since the liberation of the cities of Kramatorsk and Slavyansk. Each year we draw some conclusions. We know that some things have been rebuilt, but nonetheless we still remember what happened, what didn't happen, what people are looking for the most, and what's been done about it. Where much has been rebuilt, restored, constructed anew. It probably isn't enough because to this day there aren't any good roads between Mariupol and Kramatorsk, since all the main roads previously went through Donetsk, which is now occupied. Here things are more or less good in terms of everyday life. If we talk about ideology, mentality, then unfortunately the inhabitants of Donbass are facing a real recoil. This is because that for the past four years not a single separatist mayor who had raised the Russian flag in the Donetsk region had been sentenced. Many of them continue to be mayors without a single criminal charge levied against them, while people who in 2014 had seized cities and helped separatist activities calmly walk free. Once more, it's starting to feel like those good old days of Viktor Yanukovych. In this sense, unfortunately, there hasn't been much in terms of visible progress in the course of four years after the liberation. What specific actions are awaited from the government? We saw how Avdiivka suffered for one and a half years from lack of water and electricity. We couldn't build gas pipelines, let them get through, etc. When they say that there isn't any money, in reality that's not true, because we need to remember that approximately 3 billion hryvnia were redistributed in the occupied territories, and this money was in the budget. So in reality, instead of dealing with water access, roads, transport, energy, and some other basic things that people deal with every day. We're building parks, which cost hundreds of millions, amusement parks, pools, building up schools which we don't really need. This is the skew that we're calling infrastructural projects, which are not really so. Hence why residents are very displeased and cynical about the situation, considering they have to see all this all the time. Talking about war threats, given that politicians in Kiev are often reluctant to speak about this, and yet there is still an understanding that there is a risk of an active military campaign. It's possible that there could be a new offensive, since we know that Kramatorsk, even in 2015 after its liberation, had been targeted several times. There is constantly information about it being shelled. If we're not talking about the contact line, for example in the city of Taretsk, which is on the contact line, then all the other cities have gone gotten used to it. They're tired of living in fear. Besides everything else, people have realized that there is nowhere in Ukraine that is completely safe. Meaning, of course, Konstantinivka can be hit by Grad rockets, Kramatorsk could be hit by Smerch rockets. As for Kiev and Lviv, there are weapons that can reach them, especially those located on the territory of Russia. For that reason, in the past four years, Kramatorsk has gotten used to living. For that reason, in the past four years, Kramatorsk has gotten used to life in a peaceful rhythm. It seems to me that there isn't even talk of aerial bombardments, some sort of explosions in Bakhmut. 
The country is entering an election period, and the political autumn is starting to be active. The war has been an issue in all recent elections, and there is an understanding that each politician will in some way or another state their thoughts on it and what should be done. What do you think we should be looking out for now? What should we be paying attention to? Firstly, the main threat is the war itself. I'll remind you that at the time of the elections, a large portion of the Donetsk region was occupied and did not participate in the presidential elections. There were some separate areas in the western part of the region and in Mariupol where someone managed to vote. As for the political situation, I think that replacing the head of the region should already be begun by the president of Ukraine, because the previous governor, Pavel Zhibirsky, in terms of his personal qualities, was a very controversial figure, and in reality, he hasn't united the elite around him. He hasn't spoken to the mayors of the cities, he was confrontational with them, and under these conditions, carrying out a decent electoral campaign would be very difficult for the incumbent president. Naturally, this vacuum would be quickly filled by former Party of Regions members who currently participate in various parties and have good connections in these cities. The Nashkrai party is becoming very influential on the territory of the Donetsk region. This is a party constituted by former members of the Party of Regions, and it is a apparently very close to the presidential administration. It's essentially a pro-presidential force with a less radical patriotic bent than the Petro-Poroshenko bloc. It includes all the well-known functionaries. That is, in our city there is a known faction of Nash Krai, and these are, for all intents and purposes, former deputies of the Party of Regions. Among other things, we see a movement in Mariupol where half a million people are leaning towards the radical party. If you go there, you'll see how this party's leader, Oleg Dyashko, is congratulating everyone with everything that he can and he constantly meets with the mayor of the city. There's a rumor going around that for the next city council, the Metinvest team will go together with the radical party. A Metinvest is an enterprise owned by Donetsk-born oligarch Linat Akhmetov. Yes, yes, yes. There is an overused phrase, city-forming enterprises for Mariupol. We don't understand yet whether this game is just for the next parliamentary and municipal elections or if it's to get Mariupol to support Alek Lyashko instead of the incumbent president. Are you talking about young activists, new political leaders or politicians who simply haven't had a chance to gain ground in the area? Because in Kyiv and other regions, there are young MPs already, and you're talking about all political elites, which has changed their political views and party association. In Mariupol, people do have power through the city council, which try to shake the city up. Slavyansk also has young, strong deputies. The question lies in how much this resonates with the opinions of the society, to the extent that society accepts them, because the last municipal elections were riding a wave of patriotism and a belief in change. Unfortunately, we aren't seeing any global changes, and that might play into the hand of populist forces because there is a pullback. Many people could say, we believed the intelligent people and nothing came of it. But here's a serious man who was talking about how tomorrow everything is going to be perfect, so I'll vote for him. And this is very dangerous. Unfortunately, very often young politicians conflict with local self-government and they aren't supported by executive powers. Unfortunately, the regional state administration for the past three years hasn't done anything to empower these people. There wasn't any kind of public dialogue. The governor could have said unambiguously that there are young politicians in the city, and they are supported by the president and his subordinates. And I'm not only talking about younger politicians, but those with pro-European contemporary views. But unfortunately, this has never happened, and many of them gave up or changed sides, because no one can fight forever, or just got disappointed and gave up. Today, it's, you know, uh, it's much more competitive and democratic than, than it was under Yanukovych. I mean, you don't have major opposition leaders in jail, for example. Um, nonetheless, I think I'm actually quite troubled by some of the developments recently under Poroshenko. I mean, I think you see sort of, you know, sort of old-style abuses, such as attacks on NGOs. Um, I think the sort of effort to, um, to take away the citizenship of Saakashvili was a kind of classic autocratic move. Um, that's sort of you know familiar to you know in many autocracies and competitive authoritarian regimes in the world. But you also see kind of what's interesting um, is kind of what well, you know kind of new forms of abuse that didn't exist in Ukraine. You know, some are a product of the war, right? You have the sort of the banning of the Communist Party as a result of the decommunization law. I mean, this is something novel <laughs> um, in many ways, and um, and most um, 
competitive authoritarian regimes in the former Soviet Union have never banned the party. I mean, Ukraine has the unfortunate um, distinction of having done that. Um, and you also see kind of what I, to me, is sort of most disturbing is sort of autocracy or, you know, demands uh, for more sort of authoritarian controls emerging from below. And I'm thinking here of the Miratores um, efforts to sort of release names and addresses of, um, of journalists and the like, and these are sort of efforts to intimidate. Um, Why would you think this is authoritarian? Because it, it basically meant to discourage certain kinds of journalism and criticism of the, regi of the current um, government. And I think it's going to, you know, in other words, especially in a, you know, democracy is always under threat um, during war. I mean, it's very easy for the government in power to treat any form of criticism as fundamentally treasonous. And you see that, I mean, I see, you see that in, in my view, I mean, I'm an outsider, so, you know, um, but then, um, that you see kind of this, some discourse that sort of, you, because Putin is calling the, the Ukrainian government um, dysfunctional, if, if domestic forces call the Ukrainian government dysfunctional, they're somehow in line, in league with Putin. So there's a sort of, you know, beginnings of, you know, treating, um, uh, criticism of the government as, as treasonous. And I think that's, you know, it's very troubling. I mean, it's understandable. I think, you know, almost all countries at war, um, you know, historically have, you know, um, abrogated uh, civil liberties. In the United States, of course, we had the very sad history of interning the Japanese, and that's something we don't want to repeat. Um, so I think that's, that's, you know, not necessarily unexpected, but nonetheless troubling. Competitive authoritarian regime isn't simply when you have elections and some kind of opposition. I mean, a competitive authoritarian regime exists when you have sort of real opposition. So in Russia today, it's not competitive authoritarian regime, uh, regime because um, all the opposition is essentially systemna, you know, it's a, it's systemic opposition, as they call it there. You know, you know, they're not sort of actual, they do not actually oppose Putin. They're just there kind of for show as... Uh, whereas in Ukraine, you obviously have a real opposition, and elections are truly uncertain. So there's a massive qualitative difference between a place like Azerbaijan, Russia, and obviously the um, other uh, Central Asian countries, and Ukraine. Um, and Ukraine is much closer to Moldova, which is, um, you, know, fair, you know, it's a borderline case of competitive authoritarianism. Nonetheless, I mean, I think the abuses are serious. Uh, because it's very easy to get into this kind of a discussion uh, with the terms, and it's so easy to manipulate it uh, uh, with that today. Um, so I'm curious, um, what, are particular, what are peculiarities of having this label on the, on, on, on the nature of the regime? Uh, because... If we speak about the access to uh, media, access to the resources, uh, fair elections, because, uh, you know, where this uh, borderline, where you understand that a position is there, or some, for instance, like in case of Ukraine or Georgia, when you understand that the... In fact, there are independent media, but sometimes they don't have access. There are, you know, other parties, but they are there unless they really have the majority in their uh, municipalities, for instance. So what for you, for, for you would be this, uh, this, mar this uh, kind of landmark, benchmark? So one of the things I look for, and this was the case uh, in, with uh, Poroshenko and Saakashvili, is does the, the government regularly use the state to, to crack down, state institutions to crack down an opposition you know, in partisan ways? You know? So um, you know, that, there you have, you know, that's a classic case when you know, um, Poroshenko um, you know, in principle, the decision on citizenship should not be based on whether or not you're, you're, you potentially could threaten the president in elections. It should be based on some sort of objective, impersonal criteria. And that clearly was not the case then. I think, you know, it's similarly efforts to sort of investigate and use, uh, I mean, a classic technique in competitive authoritarianism is the use of tax audits to target um, opposition. So in the old days, you'd simply ban opposition. Right, you know that was sort of the, the old form of authoritarian, authoritarianism. You know, contemporary uh, competitive authoritarianism—it's much more subtle and, and unclear. So you uh, you sort of you 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 use tax audits against businesses who fund opposition or NGOs who are critical of the government. I mean, that's a, a classic. To me, that's a sort of definite red flag um, for you know whenever I see that happening, I think ah. Uh -huh. Um, that's probably a competitive authoritarian. Do you think in this regard, uh, you know, is Ukrainian oligarchy growing, shrinking, remaining the same, how it's transformed? 
uh, what transformation well, is going on? I think, I mean, you know, I don't have precise numbers on this, but my guess is that, you know, much of the, the oligarchy really emerged in, um, in the mid-1990s with the yep. gas market. Um, and, um, I mean, the fact that you have fewer rents from Russia, I think, sort of, you know, reduces the, uh, the access um, to those kind of oligarchic rents. So I think, on the whole, my guess I mean, I, I again, I don't have numbers to prove this. Is my guess you see a kind of, you know, overall, you, know, you still have oligarchs. You know, the country is still um, uh, dominated by oligarchs, but not nearly to the same degree as it was, let's say, under Lazarenko in the 1990s or, or you know, in the Kuchma era in the early 2000s. Coming back to the, you know, developing democracy and establishing democracy. Um, what are the the critical things to maintain? Yeah, no, I think it basically comes down to does the government use state um, institutions to punish opposition? That's basically the criteria. Do you use the, you know, the, the security the SBU, you know, or the tax officials, um, or you know the the regulatory bodies for media? You know, those, do you have instead of having sort of in, objective and personal criteria, do you use those those institutions to basically? attack um, people who criticize the government. And I think, you know, for, for me, you know, the, the critical issue, for example, in my own home country of the United States, what I'm really looking at is, you know, Trump right now is trying to politicize the FBI. He's trying to turn um, uh, the FBI into a partisan arm um, of the Republican Party to attack opposition. I mean, he's making a very explicit effort to do this, you know. And that, that to me, that's the tipping point. You know, that's why I think it's, um, you know, that's what you have to be on the lookout for, right? That, the, you know, the state institutions have to remain um, neutral to, to politics. Where else the democratic conditionality could be enforced in post-Soviet world? Russia, Georgia, Azerbaijan, Moldova, Belarus, I'll well, ask I think, about I mean, Central yeah. Asia. I'll ask about you can yeah. go in details into different uh, countries for instance. I mean, I think, you know, I think you know, democratic conditionality has historically been very successful in Moldova. I mean, you look at, um, mm -hmm. you know, because of the, the it depends. I mean, I think Ukraine. I mean, I think, and, you know, I, um, maybe this isn't pleasant here, but I do think, you know, I think... Um, it's, it's, it's a, in my view, appropriate for the United States to sort of demand sort of a democratic government, you know, exchange for aid and the like of Ukraine. I mean, I think that's just sort of, you know, I, I, and I think that, you know, we all share these values. Um, but I, mean, I actually want to step back a little bit from conditionality because I actually think that overall, um, you know, I first was active in Ukraine in the 1990s. And um, then there was this idea that, you know, um, the West, the United States, is the teacher. Ukraine is, are the students. You know, they sort of, you know, and then it's about you know the best practice in the West, transferring it to here. And I think what we've learned in the last you know two years is that we are all in this together, and this is a common fight, right? And that you know we don't. Ha the West does not have all the answers, but it's a common fight for liberal, you know, liberal democracy. And so, and I feel like, you know, it's funny because I, I give it some lectures and, and a lot of the questions I get are, you know, fake news, you know, post-truth kind of stuff. You know, what do you do about Russian aggression? And I'm thinking to myself, wow, like, you know, these are questions that are really important for my own country and I'm trying to figure it out. And so rather than sort of saying like, oh, I have all the answers, here they are, do, do what I say. Um, um, it's let's, let's, let's work on this together. And so in some ways, you know, um, Ukraine is sort of um, on the forefront. I mean, you know, I do think that um, you know Putin is really you know um, detrimental to the world democratic world order, and I think that, you know, and Ukraine is sort of on the forefront. And I think part of it is sort of not treating as treating it less as sort of the teacher student, more as sort of we're, all, we're part of the same liberal democratic team, and we have to work together to sort of save um, democracy. For um, yourself, how would you explain this success of Putin? in uh, making that happen. What really happened with the Russian society? Well, I don't or know. what I mean, he had done. I, I, what... you know, yeah. I mean, I guess, I think you're framing the question wrong. Because I think the whole issue is like, you know, um, why, you know why did democracy fail in Russia? To me, is, is, is the wrong question. My, I, my research says, well, why should there have ever been democracy in Russia? Not because of the Russian soul or like, but because, you know, um, all sorts of sort of 
fundamental, you know, access to oil, the th factors in political science that we consider, you know, sort of the prerequisites of stable autocracy, like oil, you know, state control over the economy, a very powerful security apparatus, a very weak civil society. Tell us about your life. How are Alex's children? Tell us about them. I want to say that the children are very brave. The first year and the second year even were very difficult for Alina. She argued with teachers and with other people. But now she's very wise. She has set a goal for herself, to get an education. So she's studying. Tell us about them. She's exactly like Oleg. There were many questions about Oleg, and then her teacher said, Alina, it's difficult for you here. You just need to change schools. And then she said, Grandma, I listened and listened at first, and I wanted to run away from there. And then the teacher told her to change schools. So she turned around and said, I studied here before, I'm studying here now, and I'm going to continue to study at this school. If you don't like it, you leave. She was in the fifth grade. Then she turned around and walked away. How close was he with his children? How did he raise them? He loved them very much. He took them everywhere, to the mountains, to the beach. He was always with them. If he calls or writes, Alina and him still discuss which books to read. To this day, she still listens to him very much. It was very difficult for Vlad. He didn't call him dad, he called him Oleg. Oleg was everything to him, and then suddenly he was gone. Vlad had very big eyes. He looks at you with these big eyes and asks, where's Oleg? Where did he go? Is it my fault that he left? How often do you write to Oleg? We try to write to Oleg often. Of course, we rarely receive letters from him. Maybe once every one and a half months or once a month. But we write him. I write maybe four letters a month. I just write about the children, what they're doing, where they've been, how their studies are going. I don't write about anything else. Of course, we don't write about our problems. Everything is always going well for us. The children are good. All is well. How does he sound? What was his voice like? I cried so much when he was transferred there. I did not know that he was in the detention facility or whatever it's called. There was just nothing, no letters, no phone calls. I didn't know where he was or what he was doing. And then he called. I cried non-stop for a week maybe because his voice was like that of a person who has been destroyed. It was terrible. Then a letter arrived, and he wrote that everything was fine. During the next phone call, he was happy. He had received a photo of the children. Of course, he hadn't seen them for a long time. He had been sent photos before, but there was a year and a half difference, and in that time they had grown up. He was very happy with these photos. His voice was chipper, and that meant he wasn't sick, and everything was more or less fine there. But at first it was very scary. What does he say about conditions he is held in? He never says anything. He says, I'm fine. I say, Oleg, do you need anything? I have everything I need, Mom, he says. He doesn't want to meet. No, he doesn't. He says it won't bring anyone joy, not us, not him. It will only make things harder. We wanted to come to Rostov. I said, I'll come with the children. Rostov wasn't that far away. But he said, don't. I've seen people who have been visited by their children and what happens to them later. For me, Ural is very far away. I have no idea how to get there. Alina and I looked at the map, but that's just a map. I can only imagine how long it took him to get there and in what condition he got there. My eyesight is poor now and it's difficult for me to get there myself. I really want to see him. It's frightening to think that it's possible I may never see him again. Do you speak with Sasha Kolchenko's mother? I don't talk with anyone. Is it hard? It's hard, especially because he's so young. I tear up when I think about it. If I see his mother, I might faint. It's very difficult for me. I will never approach her leg about what happened. 
This is his life. He was already 40 years old. It was his choice. Kolchenko is younger. I feel more sorry for him because he's a young boy. What would you want to say to Alec? We love you very much, son, and we're waiting for you. I want him to get out and be with the children again. Vlad needs a father. He's a sick boy. He needs development. He's not stupid. He reads wonderfully. I'm afraid that this is how the years will pass. People will forget about him and he will be in prison for 20 years. This week, I believe 15,000 people came for a rally. This was the largest rally we've ever had. Usually, we stage a large demonstration so that we are visible. But since this was spontaneous, we were just standing on the ladder. David Subeliani is one of the leaders of the Georgian White Noise Movement, which has been pushing the decriminalization for various drugs since 2015. It was White Noise which had been organizing protests meetings in Tbilisi, although the question of drug policies hasn't been coming up to these days. The night of May 12th, Georgian police conducted a set of raids against popular nightclubs in Tbilisi. They arrested several people on the charges of drug trafficking. These raids were considered to have been highly aggressive. After the raids, nightclub attendees had gone onto the streets to protest. On the 12th of May, outside of the Georgian parliament, they demanded the resignation of the Prime Minister and Minister of Internal Affairs. The protest itself resembled a rave, with people listening to loud music and dancing. People were dancing and some had been there at that moment, including my sister. After that, there was huge criticism as to how someone can dance near a memorial. The argument was that dancing is not wrong and that it's a normal and a positive thing. The people who died here and to whom the monument is dedicated also danced and sang until soldiers came with guns and so on. Dancers near the monument, which was put up in memory of the dead at a time when the 1989 rallies were being disbanded, were perceived to be blasphemous by nationalist and far-right organizations. They also accused the dancing protesters of drug propaganda. Fearing clashes with these radical groups, protesters decided to suspend their actions. Thus, Georgia was split into two camps. This is a celebration of the holiness of the family event. We just want to give everyone love, and that's all, nothing else. The Day of the Holiness of the Family is a relatively recent holiday in Georgia. It was declared in 2014 by the Georgian Orthodox Patriarch Ilya II. The rest of the world marks this as a day of anti-homophobia. Orthodox Georgians annually attend the march. Representatives of the LGBT community try not to hold any meetings on this day in order to not provoke any conflict. This year, many celebrating the holiday criticized the dance protests. Excuse me, please. Those weren't people there. They were only gays. I'll say it up front. Gay is a weak word. There were faggots standing over there. I hate them. Those weren't people. A bunch of spoiled youths were there. On the evening of May 18th, LGBT organizers gathered near the state chancellery in the center of Tbilisi. Those gatherings in Georgia are protected. Cordons of guards closed all entrances into the building. I want to live freely, calmly, to be like everyone else. I am not a lesbian, I am simply a person, I am for freedom. Homophobia is actually blooming on the streets. I have repeatedly been a victim of homophobia, as well as my 19-year-old son, just because he has long hair. For some reason, he's included. Someone didn't like that. There are many of these people. We haven't done anything wrong to anyone. I'm also here because I don't want fascists to be able to calmly congregate in my country. We defeated fascism once already. Their time is over. This is the 21st century, people. 
Near the parliament, 500 meters away, there was a meeting of anti-LGBT activists. Many of them hold far-right views. They stood there till the late evening, even when the anti-homophobia protesters had driven away on the bus. On the 17th of May, Georgian Orthodox Patriarch Ilya II declared it the Day of the Family. Sexual minorities, representatives of the LGBT community, decide to do stage protests on this day each year. There was a request today for this demonstration not to take place, and they had promised it won't be held. They even announced it on television. But in reality, we looked away for one second and they appeared, closed off and protected by police, hiding from us. This meeting here is a rally against them. Excuse me for being so blunt, but we hate faggots and lesbians. We are Georgians, real Georgians, and we love our country. Georgians live here. What sort of Georgians are they? Don't they have any faith? No, they have no faith. David Sibiliani says that the dance protests included many members of the LGBT community. Anna and Katie, who came for the anti-homophobia meeting, also protested on the 12th of May. They say they came out for freedom for all. For some reason they thought that we were defending people who were selling drugs. We're just defending our freedom. We want to live calmly, to work and to live our lives. I genuinely don't get it. Some people like to drink. I like LSD. What's the issue? I'm not doing anything bad to anyone. Drugs serve as another stumbling block within Georgian society. Towards the end of 2015, there was a general decision of the Constitutional Court that if someone has at least 70 grams of marijuana, they can imprison them. The goal of white noise is full decriminalization of all drugs in Georgia. In 2017, Parliament even considered such a bill. It was important for us to work on the entire drug policy. We couldn't focus solely on marijuana or light drugs, as they are called, which are used by clubbers and ravers. This is because people who use harder drugs are in a worse state. This isn't just a question of rights for them, but a question of health as well. If the principle changes, then it should change for everything. We wrote a bill proposal which closely resembles the system that was put in place in Portugal. But the policy proposal hasn't been even looked at. David Bitterly states that that the deputies deceived him, while the nationalist organizations have launched a campaign against white noise and its supporters. We said that we can put in decriminalization just like many countries in Europe and in the world generally have done. Our opponents started saying that this isn't a movement for users but for sellers, for drug dealers, they say. The first two years of our work had nothing to do with that. When everything was reaching the moment when a decision had to be made, they began to worsen our chances with such company. Even to this day, when we gather here, these same people come and say that these are drug dealers and traffickers. The conservatives in Georgia responded very negatively to the idea of liberalizing drug laws. In liberalizing and decriminalizing things, they want drugs as well. This is a horror. How can the government consider this acceptable? This is a sickness, a loss of character. How can the government lose its character? I don't know, they want some kind of legalization in place, but we consider it illegal, we are against it. And why you're against it? Because we are orthodox, we need dignity, family dignity. On the 19th of May, the dance protest was supposed to resume, but they had decided to cancel it. David Sibiliani stated that the protesters are seeking new outlets to reach to the government. Georgian journalist Dmitry Avliani is sure, after all this, its far-right organizations had a role in putting an end to the dance protest. A dangerous precedent had been set. The protest didn't take place because there were threats by some far-right groups, and this will continue to go on. Those far-right groups understood that they have the power to influence the position of the other side, to the position of the state, and they will continue doing so because they know they can. You need to understand that a very bad precedent has been set, that people who gathered with legitimate grievances, fully, legally, having broken no laws, peacefully were told that their activism wasn't acceptable. The way they look is unacceptable, the way they dance, and so on. And for that response, they have to leave. The days when there are no protests or meetings, everything is calm in Georgia. White Noise is saying that there will be no protests in the coming weeks. David Sibiliani is sure that there is no unsolvable schism in the Georgian society yet. As such, there is still a chance to find common ground.